everybody. Welcome to the. Fire it up with CJ show. We have back with us today, Dr. Paul White, who is the author of Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workplace. And he is going to be talking to us about remote work and what that has meant for different companies and, um, and um, what you can learn as a manager or employee and what to expect with remote work. So welcome, um, Paul. Hey, thanks for having me back. All right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about when you conducted this research, because you've been conducting this kind of research for a while. Right. Um, so give, give us a sense of the trajectory of the research, how it's evolved, and the new findings once COVID hit. Yeah, so um, we have this online assessment called the Motivating by Appreciation Inventory. 275,000 people have taken it worldwide. Mm. So we're able to sort of slice and dice it. Uh, a couple of years before COVID, I actually did some research comparing on-site employees and uh, people working remotely on how they preferred to be shown appreciation. That sort of mm. provided a baseline. I then redid uh, or looked and actually it was like April and May of 2020. So right after COVID mm. hit and saw, you know, sort of those millions of new working from home employees and how they were doing and what was making a difference between those who were doing well and those who weren't. And then came back and revisited that in September uh, and to see sort of what was going on within then, what was stressing them out. And then uh, this spring uh, did sort of this mammoth research of comparing both on-site, remote, pre-COVID, during COVID, um, and um, different age groups. And it was 200,000 people in the research study uh, on you know what's going on with them and mm. how they're doing and differences and that kind of stuff. Okay, wow. So you've got a, a co collected a bunch of data. What's so interesting is you did a pre COVID and then post COVID and right. then kind of, so can you give me kind of your, um, so when you walked in, um, what were your presumptions going in and what were, what was, what were your hypotheses and what was validated and what was not? Yeah. So I figured that, uh, so we have the five languages, right? So they're words of affirmation, quality time, acts of service, tangible gifts and physical touch, which is obviously mm -hmm tough to do remotely, right? But we, we figured out some ways around that. But to see if, you know, thought that there was some differences there, we weren't exactly sure, thought quality time would be higher for remote workers because mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. sort of more isolated and all that. Came up a little bit, but not as much as we thought. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the, the pattern remained the same for both groups, that words of affirmation are the most frequently preferred. But uh, and then quality time second, but quality time came up higher, sort of not as far behind. Acts of service was still third, gifts was fourth, physical touch is really low in the, in the majority culture in, in uh, the US and Canada. Um, and so it was interesting that it wasn't so much uh, time as much as we thought. Hmm. The difference, a difference was that um, remote workers really want um, personal connection with uh, their colleagues and team members. Mm. And that actually was the difference between those who were surviving better during COVID than those who weren't, uh, besides mm. getting decent sleep, eating right, some exercise, not binge watching the anxiety producing news, but also staying connected with your colleagues mm. at a personal level, mm. not just talking about work, but mm how you're doing, how they're doing, you know, what's going on with family and all that, that that was a key factor of people who were managing the stress better. So people who were able to connect personally with their coworkers, right. use them as a resource to help them cope through somehow. So that was like their coping mechanism Yeah, yeah. is to connect with folks. Interesting. So then what else did you find um, in terms of, so you said there's on-site and remote, and I'm sure, I mean, one of the things that's so hard is, is understanding if work, your workforce is as productive. Did you have any research on that or have you looked into that at all? 
you know, I wasn't able to, people self-reported that they felt as productive, um, but there's some bias there. Right. <laughs> we, tend, we tend to rate ourselves more highly uh, in a lot of situations, not all, but, uh, but I think a big issue that came up, um, especially in as it relates to coming back, you know, from a remote work or hybrid, is that one of the key things that people valued was uh, more time as a result of not commuting and not having to get ready for work every day, you know, sort of the dress kind of code. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for a lot of people, I mean, that was at least two hours a day that they gained mm. that they could use in family relationships or personal exercise or mm. hobbies or hanging out with the dog. You know, I mean, it was just like, and that's been sort of the pushback from employees who have been largely working remotely that they don't want to go back uh, clearly full time. And so um, just that, that, and I think that's an important data point for leaders to listen to. It, it, it sort of feeds into the process. Okay, how do we make a decision about this? Who, who comes back and when and how much and who gives input about that and um, have some thoughts about that. But yeah, that whole commute part was, is a big piece for a lot of people. Yeah, I talked to, um, well, it, when you're in places like Seattle, um, San Francisco, Boston, I'm sure, I don't know what yeah. the East Coast scenario is, but yeah. it takes you an hour or two every day, an hour one way just to get to and from work. So yep. I can totally see two hours and then add to that if you have children there's right. another like half an hour each way so there's probably three hours by the time you have like drop off one kid to preschool another kid to middle school you know drop you know whatever else you need to do but like that's probably plus the, yeah. plus the stress of the traffic or you know whatever mode you're using I mean just it's not like it's just time it's also you know, demands and stress that you have. To yeah. As yeah. Well. No, I mean, just sitting in traffic and like, oh, I've got to go to go drop someone off for soccer. And then I've got to go pick up my kid from preschool. And then someone has karate lessons. And then I've got to go drop off, you know, go to Costco, like all that kind of craziness somewhat just got eliminated because there was nowhere to go and then everything was delivered to my house exactly. a lot of that stuff has just changed so dramatically so you'd said um you said that you have some thoughts on who decides you know who decides yeah. who comes out because you know i i can see like if you have a family there's a huge quality of life impact to for the positive as a result of working remotely Right. Um, did you see any correlation of who, what people are well, thinking? Well, interesting. One survey that came out a week or so ago found that I think it was about 65% of the people surveyed, at least, said they'd rather quit than, you know, go back to uh, commuting full time. That's wow. A, that's a pretty big chunk of people. That's but huge. It is. It is. Um, and another survey showed that... Um, that people would, they'd give up a, a significant raise, like 20,000 bucks a year or whatever versus commute. So, I mean, you know, money and time and all that. But what was interesting is, you know, a few weeks ago, Tim Cook, who's the CEO of Apple, made this announcement that he wanted everybody from Apple back in the workplace at least part-time as uh, so of September 1. Uh, and he was saying like, you know, two or three days a week big reaction from all over mm -hmm. both be, you know employees or some as well as just I, everybody had an opinion about it I mean, there's all kinds of articles from leaders and all that but what was interesting to me is um, his reason was that you know he missed seeing people he missed the connectedness he felt like other people missed that too and there was a sense of you know camaraderie and, and working together in community which is fine. I agree. I mean, you know, I'm about appreciation, creating, you know, positive workplace cultures, but I think that's where he sort of missed the boat a little bit in that. And in fact, some of the responses were, dude, it's nice that you miss me, but it, you know, I'm giving up two hours of my day, you know, for that. That's not a good enough reason. And I think he missed partly at least what was reported. Maybe we didn't get everything 
uh, was that the purpose and the way we make decisions about business and our organizations is what serves our clients best. Okay, so what do the clients need? What are our customers need? Right. The people that we serve. So, it, you know, I've used this example with boomer leaders. I mean, being on time or being available may be from, you know, 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. because that's when, you know, a number of tech people are online and doing stuff at night versus 8 a.m. There's nothing magical about a.m. or 9 a.m. or anything. And it, so it's driven by your customers. Mm -hmm. um, and not even the employer. It's not what the employer wants. I mean, yeah, sort of. But hopefully that he's he or she's making decisions about what's best for the customers. But the second part of it is, is that there's more and more research that's come out that companies that have positive supportive workplace cultures are more profitable, more productive than those that aren't. Okay. Mm. To the point that the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, has made a ruling that publicly held corporations now have to report what they're doing to invest in their human capital and create positive workplaces because from an investor point of view, it's... Um, oh, wow. It's highly correlated with yeah, success. Yeah, with success. <laughs> and so now they're requiring corporations to... Uh, document that and SEC so, is requiring yeah, corporations yeah. to document workplace culture happiness or what no no, no what their investment in uh human capital uh, wow. and what they're doing to develop their their you know employees and wow. and so so I mean it just came down this last year so we know that it's not just what the customers want but also what's best for the company long-term and long-term people tend to work social beings. We need one another. And so working somewhat together uh, is important versus just having, you know, individuals sort of independently out there. Right. So, well, that's a very challenging thing. So for like Tim Cook, who, you know, who decides, was it Tim? So when you're, you, you said like a who do you think should decide like another way well, i think the leaders like i think the leaders should but but what they consider they need to consider uh what the customer and clients want or need right Not, and you have to balance it because i mean customers can be unrealistic sometimes right, right. I mean, so so you have that part what's best for the company long-term culture wise mm -hmm. which includes what's best or good for the employees individually too. So, I mean, it's a balance, but ultimately, I mean, I work with family owned businesses and I use them all. Whoever owns something, whether it's a business or a car, where you get to, if you own it, you get to decide what to do with it, right? Yeah. Give it, grow it, you know, trash it, whatever. So owners get to make the decisions in larger companies, owners, if they're shareholders, they appoint leaders to manage for them. So right. whether that's the, the board directors or the executive team. So I think he has the right to make a decision. I think right. what he communicated about the reason is what got him into trouble. Right, because um, he's like, I miss you people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, get a puppy like all the rest of us. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> you said the other thing is when remote co workers come back because um, you know, not everyone's vaccinated. I, is that what you meant when you said like there was like some concern about when? No, not so much that, but just sort of how much. Again, so I do, you know, work have worked with a lot of healthcare places. Well, if you're a healthcare provider, you got to be there. I mean, you're for a nurse or an occupational therapist, you're there. But they have IT people, accounting people who mm. maybe don't need to be there as mm. often. So it's more like proportionally. I mean, and again, lots of times we sort of in our minds as people, we default to, well, what's fair? That doesn't seem fair that, well, again, what's fair it partly depends on their job role and responsibilities, right? right? Yeah, if you're and not so, customer facing and you're not, you can't be like, hey, I'm, I decided not to come in, tell my patient that I'll call them on Zoom. Right, you know, right. like that's a very different scenario. Than or if you're managing person. people, team members as well, right? And yeah. so, so we have to get sort of away from that fairness thing, which is really a bad measure anyway. It's always in the eye of the beholder and trying right. to get, get to 
you know, a little yeah. bit more objective reason. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's basically culture it used to be like, oh, you know, when I worked at Microsoft, I was a long time ago, I was working part-time, which was not a thing at Microsoft when I was there in, the, right. in ancient times. And I don't know what it has now, but um, it was a big, like, why does she get to do that? That's not fair. And, you know, it was like always like getting my part-time status was always in jeopardy because of that. And so they would have to think about equity, like what is fair? Why does she get it? And some people don't mm -hmm. versus like, well, if she can do it and it has, you know, and she's making that choice, you're also choosing, I guess, part of that. I also wonder is that when you make choices like that, which I did, you know, I'm like, I just really want to be with my kids and I want to be, you know, working from home part of the time and I want to work part time and you're, you're stepping off the track. So already you're getting dinged, you know, right, already. Right. So you're making a conscious choice that has those kinds of impacts on your career trajectory, how fast, how much money you make. So is remote also like correlated with that or did you look at that at all? I did not look at it, but I've seen research that demonstrates that, uh, or uh, let me say purports to demonstrate, because I haven't looked at it real closely, uh, that when you work remotely, you're less likely to be advanced, uh, you know, to a higher level position. Because, I mean, well, there's lots of reasons we can infer, but one of them is those kinds of decisions are, are at least partly based on relationship, uh, you know, and so uh, if somebody knows, trusts, feels like they can communicate well with, you know, CJ, and then they don't know me as well, I may be as competent or more competent, but they don't know me, haven't communicated as much, they're going to go with what's easier for them. Right. right. The known entity versus like, I'm going to go to that person in Sun Valley who's working over there from their home. And they're like, seems like cushy living room <laughs> versus the person <laughs> who's in the, for the office slugging. Yeah. And they, yeah. They go skiing for a half a day. And then yeah. they come in, so. <laughs> um, so, so, so what else did you find? You said that um, when you did it, you saw some really interesting thing in terms of the age groups and demographics. What did you see were some of the key differences? Well, it's interesting. And it, it, it really supports other observations and research is that younger employees, and I'll say 35 and below, pick, pick a number there, um, value peer relationships and collegial relationships more than they do managerial relationships, right? So in the old days, <clears throat> there was a saying, people don't leave a job, they leave a manager or supervisor. Mm -hmm. That was true then, less true now. People will endure a less than healthy relationship with their supervisor if they really get along with and work well with their team members. Mm. And so part of the issue of quality time did pop up. And for that age group, it also was, again, relatively higher. But as we look at the specific actions, and that's one of the things we've learned through our inventory is it's not just the language, but the actions. So quality time can be individual time with your supervisor and manager. You wanna either share thoughts or learn from them or whatever. But for younger workers, I, I tell leaders, older leaders, just because one of your team members has quality time as their preferred language of appreciation doesn't mean they want time with you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> because they want to hang out with their colleagues, go out after, you know, work or get together on weekends. So th there's that dynamic that, you know, it differs across age. Um, interestingly, um, Acts of service uh, tends to be higher for uh, older employees, so 50 and above. That, again, it's not a huge deal, but it's, it's prevalent that, you know, hanging out or words isn't as important to them as you helping them get things done that are, uh, you know, sort of on their plate. I see to be like, hey, no, it looks like you're really busy. Can I help you out? That kind of acts of service are more sure. important. Yeah. Or, or like if you're on a time limited project and you're pushing to get it done, it's like, okay, hey, is there something I could do to help you out here? We'll either cover 
emails, calls, so you can stay focused on this or you can delegate some part to me. Yeah, that's really interesting. I wonder if I, I'm, I'm just hypothesizing and making up all sorts of stories, but I know like, you know, part of it is in, in as someone who's 50 or older, you know, part of it is that there's so much just changing in this world of everything is high tech, you know, right. things are moving. It seems much faster than even when I was in my 20s, you know, so it's probably when you're 50, I'm not trying to be ageist, but I know for myself, it's like, oh my God, that's moving. That's now I'm doing Slack. I'm doing what? I'm like, no, I'm doing that. I'm doing a, right. what's GitHub, you know? Like, like <laughs> well, and I just, I just have a situation where, um, yeah, I mean, used to, I would do my own online research looking for articles and stuff, but some of that has changed as well. And so I'm, I'm asking a younger team member to go look for something for me versus yeah. me sort of, you know, fight through the woods to try to get there. right i mean things are just more like it's like people the younger folks seem to be able to navigate a little bit more easily some of this online world and you know i think about my kids because my husband's been reading all these articles on remote work as um you know opening up all this potentiality and our kids are like i i do not want to work remotely because right. I have a son that, like I said, is, is actually um, starting a job right away. And he's like, I do not want to be working remotely because that's where I meet all my friends. Like, right. why would I want to do that? Especially in tech companies, it's basically, it's like your freshman class in college. Like the people right. that, it, when I was at Microsoft, the people that I started off with at Microsoft were my like freshman class. And I've stayed friends with them hmm. throughout my Microsoft career. Like it, that's kind of how it works. Cool. So. I can totally see with that particular age, 35 and under. And then when I hit 35 and you have kids, you're like, I don't need to see any of you people. <laughs> <laughs> Love you guys, but I need time with my family. I mean, yeah, I, exactly. I had a guy say that to me. He said, I like you guys. I enjoy time, but my priority is my, is my spouse and my kids. So I wonder when people are like, when the kids are empty nesting, if they felt like they liked remote work as well. Hmm. Did you find that too? Yeah. Um, there wasn't that much difference in that way, but just from personal anecdotes, myself and my wife and our friends, that a lot of uh, them like working remotely because it gives you the opportunity to go hang out with your grandkids, you know, in a yeah. different city or whatever, and you can work ah. there. Oh, so it's lifestyle, quality of life is actually starts kind of, you're kind of looking at like, all right, oh, that's really interesting. The thought of, hey, I'll take 20 grand less I, I'll take this job, but that way I can go skiing in those two extra hours that I have in Sun Valley or spend time with my grandchildren or live in an RV and do my work across the country, which I mean, I've seen all sorts of yeah. things. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing I know, like in, in Amazon here, we have some friends here who, if you decided during COVID to live in, um, let's say, a foreign country where the cost of living is a lot less, mm -hmm. they adjust your salary commensurately with that. Because uh, okay. the salary is based on where you live geographically, and it's expensive to live in Seattle. So they pay you right. Seattle wages. But if you move to Dublin, where they also have an office, the wages are for Dublin, which you can live pretty nicely with yeah, yeah. a lot less with. Um, so that's been kind of an interesting thing with the remote work is that they want to know and they'll, and they have to send you your money. So they know where you're living. Right. Ah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, and I would hate to be a CFO in that situation. I know. I think it's, it's a very complex thing because I think if going back to what you said, if you really just want to have a nice workplace culture, every single age group is going to have a different thing that they want and a different point in their life that they want. Um, I think it would be very complex to make as a manager deciding these things because there's also the cost of building. So there's some, like a lot of high tech companies are like, I don't need to go build another gigantic building in San Francisco or Seattle. So if you want to work remotely, great. You know, yeah. IBM actually required some of their employees to work remotely because they didn't want to house them in right. an office space. I mean, are you finding that that's, I know yeah, that your research doesn't cover that specifically. No, but, but as I interact with clients and, the, and companies and organizations we serve, it is there. Uh, the other challenge is onboarding, right? How do you onboard yeah. successfully and, in, in, you know, incorporate 
values and culture and how you do things as a company because I'm guessing, you know, I'm not a techie, but I'm guessing that Microsoft culture and, you know, Apple culture were pretty different at some point, you know, and how they approach things. And how do you do that remotely? And that, and that's uh, a challenge we've that's really interesting. tried to, to help out with um, in providing some remote resources to help people sort of get connected, stay connected. And, and let me just say one more thing about the remote thing and connection. It's one of the things we found is that you to do it successfully, you have to be proactive, right? Because mm-hmm. on site, you walk by somebody's office or cubicle and stick your head and say, how it's going, or you see them in the break room or on the way in. That doesn't happen when people are remotely, you know? And so you've got to sort of have some reminders, uh, whether it's their picture or, you know, something on your calendar whatever to reach out. Otherwise, you know, you may not see them except for at the weekly or daily, you know, uh, sort of stand up meeting kind of thing. Yeah. And so we really encourage people to, and teams to uh, sort of use those meetings as a starting point. Cause in the old days, you know, you'd go maybe five minutes early and you talk and see somebody in chat and see what they did last night. So we're, we encourage people to, you know, open up the meeting 10 or 15 minutes before and mm. stay later. So people can still stay on and chat. Um, mm. Or another helpful tool is to ping somebody, email, text, or whatever you use, and say, hey, I'd like to catch up with you for a few minutes. When would be a good time? Because remotely, one of the barriers is we don't, we don't know what they're doing, so we don't want to interrupt them, right? right? But if we say, hey, you got time later today or tomorrow, you pick a time, and then you get on, and then it's just informal chatting. I mean, you might have a business thing, but if people, you know, sort of remote communication sort of declines to just uh, work and task related things. I mean, whether the project is the task list, the budget, and you don't talk about other things. So then what happens is most of your communication, if not all of it, is just about getting things done. So now you are just a production unit to me. Okay, uh... You're not a person. I don't care, you know, you know, how the giants did last night or, you know, whatever. Right. And so we've got to help people sort of open that up. And I tell leaders, don't just ask questions. Otherwise, it feels like an interrogation, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know, what'd you do this weekend? How's your wife? <laughs> what's, what's, what's your friend? But share some, you know, and say, hey, I got to go sailing with my brother this weekend or my grandkids or uh, and finally playing t-ball, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, it's a two-way kind of communication. Yeah, it's hard because, you know, they're... From what I can tell from the various assessment tools that I've given people, you know, half of the people are task related and half of them are are relationship oriented. So, and I don't know if it's exactly half, but it's pretty close. It's not like it's like 10% or or relationship and 90% or task. And it, and it very much varies per occupation. So if you have a whole bunch of software developers, they're pretty much task. Right. right. But if you have a whole bunch of people in sales, they're mostly relationship. And so it, it seems like, yeah, that's a really interesting thing to like figure out ways to cultivate that kind of socialization, because some people, if they don't know how your weekend has gone, they can't operate for the rest of the day. I'm, I'm, I literally have talked to people like if I don't they'll say if I, I need to ask, you know, because I'm there'll be a person who's like, why do you have to find out about my weekend? Right. Really? Right. Do we, can we just dispense with all the chit chat? <laughs> and, and the person has said, if I don't know what your weekend was like, I don't have a sense of what your mindset will be right now. And I right. don't know necessarily how to work with you if I don't mm-hmm. know that. But if I know that, you know, you had a hairy weekend, you know, you were like traveling and you're a little bit burnt out. I know like, don't go asking this person for a bunch it. of different things because right. I'm trying to relate to them so I can be sensitive to what their needs are. So it's not like I know it's, people it's not the, tasked. yeah yeah it's not the intrusive I want to know about your personal life per se. It's more about I need I want to understand contextual cues so that I can relate to you appropriately and not you know yeah for some of the demand that you don't want to deal with. And it's awkward. Like I have been watching my um, 
son talk he's in a internship and his boss is like trying to you know and when you're in an internship right they're hire they're basically trying to hire you they're trying right. to find like we're doing some pre-recruiting and you know yeah. assuming that you're good we're bringing you back on so like they're trying to build a relationship and it's very hard you know he like they're in different time zones so like my son is waking up at 6 4 6 30 in the morning talking to someone at 9 30 in the morning you can imagine how that conversation is gonna go uh, haven't had you my know, coffee like a, yet exactly a 20 year old who's like oh, like, oh my gosh, you know yeah. so it's like how was your weekend it's like good you know i mean it's just <laughs> ask me later <laughs> exactly so you have the time zone difference you have like a gigantic age difference you yeah. know so it's hard to even find natural points of connection even like it sounds stupid but like wow what what the weather was crazy this weekend and you're like yes because right. you both experience the same weather right. but in this case it's like well you know, you're on the East coast, I'm on the West coast, you know, yeah. we're having different, even weather, like just no team sports teams that both of us are cheering for. So there's like right. less, I'm wondering how that even works when you're trying to communicate with people who are in different coasts, different time zones, like how does that seem to be working with folks? It's a challenge. Uh, it is. And, and that's why I think uh, and again, you know, there's some decent research about, you know, emotional intelligence and soft skills being a key component to being successful at work and promoted uh, because you, it takes some skill to, to manage that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. I did an international um, presentation to largely a group of, in, in Europe. So I talked to him about, you know, soccer but i called it football right and i didn't i mean i didn't call it soccer because that's an american term you know and yeah. just trying to to uh understand what's going on with them and use terms and all that so it it, it takes some skill and here, here's the other thing that i found is that lots of times especially in this setting but there are times when we don't really value or appreciate somebody partly because we don't know them yet you know and so a key different just to try to sort of grind it out and say i'm going to appreciate you you know doesn't right. really work but getting to know somebody and so taking some time like we would do over coffee or a drink or a meal or whatever and say you know i don't know that much about your background where'd you come from where'd you grow up because those provide touchstones like i mean both people mm. grew up in the south you know or both people grew up you know in boston and they're you know, New England fans, you know, for the Patriots and all that. I mean, by the way, different sports teams, what the connector is that you both hate the same team, right? So like everybody <laughs> hates the Raiders, you know, uh, this way, you know, so so you may not cheer for the same one, but you both. You yeah, we both we, we hate the Raiders and can, can connect on that from that perspective. But That's also just, yeah, I yeah. mean, life circumstances where they went to school, what kind of school, you know, uh, sort of life pathway and, you know, growing up uh, with a single mom or, I mean, any kind of touchstone just about yeah. the life makes it easier than if you're just dealing with the blanks. Yeah. And I think that that's hard because a lot of these times, like people are recruiting new people and they're, they don't have any of those touchstones or any kind of like graceful periods where, you know, even where you're like waiting for a bus, you know, you'd be talking to your boss, maybe you're waiting for a coffee or waiting in line for lunch. Like there are these natural points mm -hmm. when you can kind of talk and that's not happening with remote. So any other um, uh, steps that supervisor or managers can take to encourage their staff? Well, one of the things is, and this is true for our whole sort of approach is that appreciation and support is not the full and sole responsibility of the manager or supervisor. You just can't carry it all. You can't get it done. And actually, especially with the culture of the younger employees, they want to know how to support and encourage one another. I mean, mm. it, and so that collegial part. So part of it is not just you doing it, but taking the time to teach, train, provide tools for your team members to interact. So, so during COVID, my team at times would have, you know, sort of virtual 
coffee break or lunch together, I wasn't invited. (laughs) (laughs) Not that I'm hurt about it. Yeah, Jackie, get over it, Paul. (laughs) (laughs) But but it was important. And and in fact, there were times when I had a sense that one of the team members was feeling a little bit outside and I sort of cue somebody else, hey, would you mind checking in with Yeah, go have lunch with so-and-so. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's really important not to try to do it all yourself, but to really try to Mm. engage the team to to support one. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, And any other challenges that you're noticing with this hybrid workforce that you wanted to mention from your research? Just that it's, it's fluid, right? I mean, we're learning along the way and that whole fairness thing, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, and I, and I think the other part that some of our research showed about sort of mental health issues, and I'm putting an article together, I really don't like just talking about the mental health of employees. To me, that's sort of a whitewash of let's talk about, you know, stuff, but not do anything, but understand that, I mean, people have and are struggling with loneliness, depression, anxiety, um, you know, and, and. Hmm. being just alert to that not that you have to solve it but again a listening ear can go a long way to help at least connect them to some help or something like that so um i I really don't i I think we need to understand we have come through a really stressful time somebody's mentioned that they they think we're going to go through sort of ptsd as as a culture i don't know what that looks like but i know that we've been stressed we're still trying to figure it out because it's still different, right? Um, and and a good thing that's come out of that is I think there's been more <coughs> a graciousness between people, like you know when you have the cat go across the screen or whatever, you know, on the Zoom, right? You know, uh, yes. you know, and we've loosened up a little bit about that, and so I, I think that's good. But we need to continue that versus get, <laughs> getting into Even- this. You know when it's bad when I was like watching PBS NewsHour and Lisa DiGiordano would be doing and her cat, you would just see this black tail. I'm like, <laughs> this is national news. Yeah. And this cat is just like back and forth, back and forth, licking itself. And I was like, all right, we've hit a new normal. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think the key theme is to remember we're people and we're social beings and we need one another and need to stay connected at some level and it'll differ from person you know introverts and extroverts but we all need it to some degree it's always so fun to talk to you um i've been talking to dr paul white who is the co-author of the book five languages appreciation in the workplace and we've been talking all about remote work and and the changes that it's bringing and um and some possibilities of new ways of working with people and um the openness that it's requiring of all of us, you know, um, and to change, you know, we've been asked to change. Um, Thank you so much for your time. You bet. I always enjoy it, CJ.